It's my pleasure to introduce our first guest of honor of, uh, of LutonaCon 28, uh, Mr. Yunha Lee, uh, who's uh, an American writer of Korean origin, and uh, he, he's been writing and selling stories since at least 1999, and his first novel was nominated for the uh, Hugo Award this year and won the Locus Award for the best uh, the best debut novel. So, without further ado, Yun Ha. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you all for having me in Lithuania. Your country and your city is very beautiful. Also, it does not have mosquitoes or alligators. I am from Louisiana, so this is a very important thing. I am talking here today about world building and games, and I am actually very delighted to see that there are people selling board games and card games outside in the lobby there. I grew up playing uh, not just board games, but also card games and tabletop role playing games. So things like chess, uh, Go, which I don't know how well known it is in Europe. It's called Baduk in South Korea and Wei Chi in China. Um, we played, my sister and I tried to play poker and we're very, very bad at, at it. But we were playing for chips, so it didn't matter. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, game books such as Fighting Fantasy, and of course, computer games. My parents made the mistake of giving us a computer and letting us play whatever we wanted. So when my sister was approximately 10 years old, they, there we were playing Wolfenstein 3D and shooting Nazis on the computer. I'm going to look at this topic from two angles. The first of them is that games can be part of the world. And if you think about this, this makes sense. Whether you're talking about real games or invented games in a work of science fiction or fantasy, Pretty much every culture in the world has games of some form, whether it's a children's jump rope game or mancala, something as simple as playing truth or dare, or chess variants, or the very popular sports, uh, football or soccer. I guess we call it soccer in the US, but I guess you call it football here? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm wrong, you guys are right. <laughs> Sports often show up in various forms. There was this one point in uh, my reading of science fiction when I kept coming across various speculative scenarios of baseball, and I still do not have any explanation for this, and also it was very difficult because I do not understand the rules of baseball, but uh, there are also a lot of science fiction races, especially in visual media. If you saw the rather lamentable Star Wars movie, The Phantom Menace. It featured pod racing, um, and racing can be, A, it's very easy to explain, everyone knows what a race is, and B, it's very visually appealing. You can get a lot of visual excitement across. For a more cerebral turn, you have games such as chess, Chess tends to be very popular in English language science fiction and fantasy. I think partly because it has such a long history and partly because of its imagery. There was a recent Japanese anime, uh, Code Geass. I don't know how many of you... <laughs> yes, okay, Code Geass people. Uh, so our hero is named Lelouch Lamperouge. And in the very first episode of this anime, he is shown playing chess against this arrogant nobleman, and he completely wallops the nobleman at chess. I am informed that the chess game does not actually make any sense, if you know what chess is, but what this does is it's foreshadowing that Lelouch is going to fight against the evil empire, and the way he's going to do this is as sort of a master manipulator. Later on in the series, we see him ordering about his newly recruited troops, and he is addressing them as if they are chess pieces, such as pawns and knights. And this tells you something about his personality, because he is talking to them as if they are pawns or pieces, and then he forgets He's doing all right up to a point, and then he realizes that 
this does not work because human beings are not game pieces. His, uh, basically his recruits have an issue where they don't understand his orders and they, have a, they freak out, they have a failure of morale. And part of his growth during the series is him learning how to manipulate people. It's sort of his primary mode of being and also in a way his downfall. There are invented games, such as the one in Charles Vitavet and Catherine McLean's story, The Second Game, which starts out with a man who is a chess player, so again, we're starting with a familiar game, but they just, the thrust of the story is that they are trying to outsmart a race of aliens who are in a superior position. Uh, it's been a while since I read the story, but I believe that's the gist of it. And there's a gambit in the game that is echoed in the plot of the story. So in order to outsmart the aliens in the game, he, is, he also has to outsmart them in uh, their political relations. For a more recent example, there is Ian Banks' Player of Games. Uh, how many of you have read Ian Banks? British author? Yeah. Uh, he has a protagonist who is a master game player, and yet he does not realize that he is himself being played or manipulated by powers in his society. What they do is they tempt him to cheat at a very difficult gambit in a famous game, and then they send him to another planet in order to play against people in a brutal dictatorial regime. And in this regime, people are um, tortured as, a, as part of sort of a ritual game in that society. And so he is sent to try to ameliorate what is going on. It's a, it's a very complicated setup, but it's very interesting. And if you can find it, if you can find it I, I do recommend the book highly. Um, in Piers Anthony's Mac Crisco, there are musings on a game called Sprouts, which was invented by mathematicians John Conway and Michael S. Patterson. Sprouts players? The gist of the game of Sprouts is that you start with two dots, you draw two dots, and you draw a line between them, and then you place a new dot on the line and your line can go around, I mean, I say line, it's not a line in the mathematical sense, but it can be a curve, it can go around things, it can go around other dots, so long as it doesn't intersect itself. And what you do is you keep connecting, players take turns connecting the two dots and putting down a new dot until no one can move anymore, and the last player who is able to make a move is the winner. It sounds like a very simple game, and the, the rules are very simple, but it's actually mathematically more complex than it sounds. And that's, that's actually true of a, um, a lot of uh, games that have very interesting complexity. Go, for example, has very, very simple rules, but is very difficult to uh, play at a high level. There is a second angle, which is perhaps more interesting, which is using existing games as inspiration for world building in your works of science fiction or fantasy. There used to be sort of an interesting sub-genre, almost stereotypical, uh, where people would take their role-playing games, such as Dungeons and Dragons, or uh, I don't know what common games are here. Uh, there's a German one called Das Schwarze Auge that I saw a version of. But there used to be the stereotype that people would write up versions of their role-playing game campaigns. This does not tend to work so well because games uh, rely on player participation in a way that cannot be replicated so easily for the reader. But you, if you don't take it so literally, it can be done successfully. There was a series by a, an American writer named Joel Rosenberg called Guardians of the Flame. It's actually extremely American because a bunch of American role-playing gamers um, are transported to the world of their game. So they have a fantasy game, and their game master is actually an evil wizard who sends them to this world. And the first thing, practically the first thing they do when they discover that the elves keep slaves is that they decide to free all the slaves by inventing gunpowder. So it's extremely, extremely American in Outlook. <laughs> um, 
There are also many tabletop role-playing games, war games, miniature games that have rich campaign settings. Uh, for example, Dungeons and Dragons had one called The Forgotten Realms, and it had many interesting characters such as Elminster, uh, the Blood Dark Elf, who was actually not evil, Drist, I cannot pronounce his name, it's, it's something like Dristo or Erden. Uh, Planescape was a very interesting one that I will talk a little bit more about later. Uh, Warhammer 40k, or Warhammer 40,000, which is known for its grim, dark future, in which you have orcs and space marines and chaos, uh, this spawned a whole bunch of tie-in novels and was actually one of the inspirations for my space opera trilogy. Battletech was somewhat inspired by the Japanese anime giant robots, uh, mecha and genres, and it also had a large series of novels based on the property. And I think we're seeing a little more of the giant robot thing going on in American science fiction, simply because anime has penetrated the culture to such an extent. If you're familiar with Pathfinder, Pathfinder is a Dungeons and Dragons derivative, uh, that also has tie-in novels and a very typical uh, Western fantasy. You know, it has its elves, it has its halflings, which are really hobbits, except you're not allowed to call them hobbits because the Tolkien estate will sue you if you do. You also have video games that have very rich worlds and backstory. There is a on massively online game called EVE Online that... I used to be an EVE Online widow or something, because my husband would play it for pretty much all the free time that he had, and I would, there was, this, okay, there was this one time I had a pressing question about black hole physics, and my husband is a gravitational astrophysicist, and I said, dear, could you answer me this question about black holes, and he said, no, I have to play my spaceship game. <laughs> so I went to a website, and I have not stopped teasing him about this ever since. All the fi Final Fantasy games, if you're familiar with Jap Japanese role-playing games, also tend to have very rich stories, very rich worlds in which there are uh, moral dilemmas. Those have spawned movies as well. When I was writing my first novel, Nine Fox Gambit, I was influenced by a number of games. Uh, going back to Planescape, that was one of them. So Planescape has this concept of consensus reality where what you believe can become real, and the more strongly or more people believe in something, the, the realer it becomes. There's actually a point in this game where you meet this man called, I believe his name was Adon, it's been a while, you, you meet a man, and you can actually argue with the crowd that this man does not exist, and if you do it well enough, he stops existing. It's incredibly mean. I, 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 I had real moral issues with this part of the game. But this is... Not only can you disbelieve people out of existence, uh, one of the core premises of Planescape is that you have different planes uh, of different alignments, so good, evil, lawful, chaos, and if a city is, say, lawful good, it will be located in a lawful good plane, but if the inhabitants of that city start to behave in a way that is not lawful anymore, they become more chaotic, more random, the city will actually shift its location to another plane. So it's, it's a setting in which Belief is extremely powerful, and it's a very, it's very original and very well realized in this game setting. Other games feature clans. There's one called Legend of the Five Rings, which is sort of based on samurai fantasy. It's, I say samurai. It's not, it, it, it's not very historically rea realistic. But what it does feature is a number of different clans, and each clan has a specialty. This is something that we see in a number of games, such as Vampire the Masquerade. You can also see it in fantasy series such as uh, the Song of Ice and Fire, the Game of Thrones books, and of course the Harry Potter Hogwarts houses, where each house or faction or clan has its own specialty, and every 
And the, what this does is it encourages people to identify with their own group. It, it sort of, it's sort of a very tribal thing going on. So that's one other place where I took inspiration from games. When I was writing my book, I decided that, well, I'm writing a horrible dystopia, but as a way of giving people an entry point into the setting, I am going to divide my uh, elites into these six different factions. So there's a spy faction, there's a military faction, there's a high culture and diplomacy faction, and that would help people get a handle on the setting more easily. You can get inspiration from uh, game supplements. There, there is one called City of a Thousand Masts, I believe, which is, which is, uh, it's a list of 1,000 non-player characters that you that are sort of generic. For example, evil crime lord, innocent wife, and you can take them and you can drop them into any of your game settings. But the thing is, you can also use this as a resource when you are writing something. You could drop someone into you could drop someone into your story and use that as inspiration. Game mechanics are often an interesting starting point for magic or technological systems. If you think about it, when you're writing a when you're writing a story and you have a specific magic system, such as uh, the channeling from Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time or the Sorry, lost my thought, train of thought. Anyway, you can have, oh yes, sorry, Brandon Sanderson. Brandon Sanderson is an American writer who is known for very mechanistic, very uh, almost physics-like magic systems. And what I mean by physics-like is not that they can actually happen in real life, but that there's a very rigid set of rules. And once you know the set of rules, he extrapolates from them very rigidly. So it's almost like a game system. And it would not be difficult to take a Brandon Sanderson system and turn it into a game. So it's a very similar mode of thought that you can use when you're developing a story. Does anyone have questions or comments so far? Okay. <laughs> Sometimes you see people taking inspiration from video games. There, I think the trend of, um, there was one, I think there was an Orson Scott card novel where he took the inspiration of the heads-up displays that you see in many first-person shooters and video games and he actually had his, I think his soldiers, using some kind of interface that was right in front of their, it was basically projected onto their eyeballs, and it would follow, it would track your vision wherever you looked, which seems kind of impractical to me because eventually your eyes would get tired and you would need to blink. But it, it very clearly came from the video game. There's also respawning, you're familiar with the very many video games where they shoot you and then you come back in a particular spawn point and then of course someone's camping there and they shoot you again. Uh, don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> yeah, um, word of advice, when you're 38, don't play first person shooters against 16 year old guys, it doesn't work. I need to be in the old person's league. So. Jay Posey, for example, is a video game writer. He has written four video games, and when he wrote a novel about a special forces squad in the near future, uh, sort of humanity has settled, in, settled Mars and so on, you can see that background in his story because his super soldiers have some kind of procedure done to them so that when you kill them, there's a backup made and their consciousness is downloaded into the new body and they basically respawn. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, you got that from video games. Uh, there's no other explanation for that. And there's nothing wrong with it. You know, when people ask me where I get my story ideas, sometimes it feels like they're asking me to tell them that 
I was influenced by the greats of the literature, Tolkien, or I don't know, War and Peace, or Beowulf, or something. And I have to tell them, no, I grew up playing video games, I grew up playing role-playing games, and that's really where, that's really where my heart is, and that's why the fiction that I write has that kind of aesthetic. Sorry, the talk is so short. I was leaving time for questions. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, which would you say is the most uh, creative video game you have played and which would you recommend the most for everyone? Oh, that's, that's a flame war waiting to happen. <laughs> but um, I think I would name, I'll give you one for fantasy and one for science fiction. For fantasy, I have to go back to Planescape Torment. Uh, not just because it implemented the setting so thoroughly, uh, you, you have a setting that has a slang, it has its uh, very, very unique view of reality, but it also had a, an emphasis on philosophy. The, the driving question behind Planescape Torment is what can change the nature of a man? And your player, as a player character, you start out as an amnesiac immortal. You literally cannot die. And in fact, there are puzzles in this game that you cannot solve unless you kill, unless you end up killing yourself, essentially, because you'll always come back. So you can use this as a way of solving problems. The science fiction game that I found most influential was actually Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, which, uh, it's sort of based on the Civilization franchise of games, but it was a science fiction take, so you have your different factions that have settled a new planet called simply Planet, and each faction um, embodies a different sort of philosophy of life. For example, the Spar Spartans are very martial. Uh, Lady Deirdre of the Gaians is very environmentally focused. There's a faction called the Morganites who are, I hate to say it, they're Americans on, they're Americans on adrenaline. They're, you know, it's all about capitalism and making money. Uh, and one of the interesting things that Alpha Centauri does, and which you can probably find on YouTube, is it has different secret projects. And each secret project, when you complete it, has a short video that shows you what that secret project has done. So there's one that called the Hunter-Seeker algorithm that seeks out and destroys viruses. Yes? Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> there, uh, there's another one that causes your um, science, your scientific facilities to be able to communicate with the planet and each time you make one of these key discoveries you see a video that shows how it affects your, uh, shows how it affects the world. So I found that very interesting and very well done. And again, if you don't want to play this game for, you know, 227 turns, just, just Google and find the YouTube videos. Any other questions? Uh, hello? Uh, I was wondering, uh, do you see, or, or, or how, do, how would you perhaps define, like, what are the differences between writing uh, narratives and, and doing world building for linear mediums such as, like, books or movies, and then how does the interactive nature of video games or board games or any games, for that matter, uh, sort of affect? So. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I. So, I have done a little bit of experimenting with uh, interactive mediums such as parser-based IF, uh, similar to Zork. And I, I would say that the hard part is predicting what the player is going to try to do. Because when you are, when you are writing for a linear narrative, you control the reader's experience. Like the reader can't say, no, I am actually, no, actually the main character is not going to, I don't know, kill the villain at this point. I am going to negotiate with him instead. Like, I, I guess you could do that and it's called fanfic, 
but it's not, it's not actually in the text. Whereas if you are scripting for a game, you have to account for the different possible responses that the player will input at various points of the game. So, for example, if I were confronting a dragon, and then I will have to write the different possibilities. Am I only going to fight with the dragon? Am I going to try to bribe the dragon with treasure? Am I going to engage the dragon in a scintillating conversation on cooking? Am I going to set? Am I going to send? Am I going to pay mercenaries to deal with the dragon? I, you know, you just have to do so much more anticipation when you are world building for a player or even a group of players. And I think it's harder in something like a massively multiplayer online game where you have so many more players and therefore so many more possible responses, especially since players will become dis disgruntled if they see a possible solution to something and they have to jump through hoops instead because the writer or the programmer has not, for has not foreseen what they want to do. Uh, question would be, um, do you think it's hard not to overbuild the world? I mean, there are stories we know where the world essentially overwhelms and, and pushes away the hero and, and the action. I think that's definitely something that can happen. There's a writer named Patricia, Patricia Reedy, and she says there are two kinds of world builders. The first is bubble world builders. And these are people who only world build the surface. You know, they only show you what you need in order to get along. And that can be fine, especially for a shorter work. But if you try to dig under the surface, there's nothing there. The other kind of writer, she says, is the iceberg writer. And Tolkien would be a very prime example of this kind of writer, where they sit there and they, they invent Elvish, and they invent Orcish and they have 200,000 years of history of the world. And part of the danger of doing it this way is A, um, if your publisher has given you a deadline, they will not be very happy with you. Um, B, <laughs> it can definitely be a detriment in a very action-oriented narrative because basically, anytime you want the reader to be focused on something, the more the more words you put in their way, the harder it will be for them to get through to, into the narrative. So that's definitely something that can happen, yes. Overdone? I think, I mean, it's partly a matter of taste because definitely some readers enjoy worlds that have a lot of detail to dig into. When I was younger, I did not appreciate this kind of world building, and I would skim or skip ahead to the end, which I know you're not supposed to do. Um, I actually find Tolkien very difficult to read because he has such a deep sense of history and time, and I know many people like Tolkien for that very reason, so this does come down to taste again. Uh, I tried to read Jonathan, what was it called? Susanna Clark's book, Jonathan Norrell and Jonathan. Sorry, I cannot title tonight. I, I'm so sorry, but yes, that book. I had a I had a very difficult time getting, trying to read that book because again, it was very it it felt very elaborate and it demanded more of my brain than my brain was able to give. Now, whether the fault is with the writer or with with the reader, I mean that's a that's a question of interpretation. Any more questions? Well... I just wanted to say, there is a way in which fantasy, you can get the reader to do a lot of the work. And you can give a hint at, to the reader, and then the reader builds castles in their own mind without um, the writer having to do too much work. I just wondered if that was useful that technique is useful to you, or whether um, coming from games you need a, uh, the game structure is, is, is more where you're focused? Uh, that's an interesting question. So with my first novel, one of the things that people, 
Okay, one of the things that some people liked and one of the things that some people hated was that I did not do, I basically didn't do exposition. I did not explain anything. So I had, for example, an object called a weather eater. And what the weather eater does is, you know, if there's a storm, sorry. Didn't break anything, I swear. Anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna put this down here before I do break something. Anyway, what, what a weather eater does is it's a, it's a magical construct where if you launch it at a storm, it eats the storm, there is no more storm. But I never actually spelled this out. Instead, I, had people, I showed people using the weather eater and they were supposed to infer from both the name and from the action what it did. Some people really liked this because they felt that I was trusting them to figure things out for themselves. Other people found that this hurt their brains and they were not having any of it. So I think it can be a very useful technique, but you know, you do, if the farther away you get from standard science fiction or fantasy terminology, for example, at this point, if we say hyperdrive, everyone knows what a hyperdrive is. Like you don't have to sit there and say, oh, and by the way, the hyperdrive expands space or punches a gate through space-time or whatever, like we all understand what a hyperdrive is. But if you make up something that is not in the common vocabulary of science fiction and fantasy, that does not um, adhere to the tropes that we are familiar with, then you are, I think you're likely to run into more problems. Or that's been my, my limited experience. Anyone else? Speaking of tropes, uh, uh, what is your opinion about uh, using these uh, set in stone uh, staples like uh, elves or the hyperdrive? Do you think it's better for the author to come up with everything themselves because uh, the repeated elements get stale after a while because we keep seeing them everywhere? Or um, <clears throat> basically, what's your opinion about using these? Uh, I think that it's not so much that the element. I mean, you can always use an element in a stale way, but I, it's also possible to take an element and put your own spin on it. And the other thing to remember is that there's always a new generation of readers coming into this stuff. I have a 13-year-old daughter, and for me personally, I don't read dragon stories anymore. Like, I have seen a lot of fantasy dragon stories come and go, there's not a whole lot of huge, new, exciting things that you can do with a dragon that will wow me. But my daughter, when she, my daughter is still reading dragon stories at the age of 13 because she has a thirst for it and because for her, a lot of these things that I find, new, I find very familiar are still, it, it's new for her. So she comes to it anew. And I think also as we see more interchange between different cultures, for example, in the US, we're seeing a lot of influence from anime because we're, you know, there's a lot of anime and manga. So we're seeing, we're seeing world building that draws upon tropes that used to be more common in uh, Asian media. So as long as people are willing to explore different angles on a different trope, on particular tropes. I don't think it's necessarily bad to use a trope in and of itself. We still have a lot of time for questions, so, so don't hesitate to ask. You mentioned the drawing a lot of inspiration from role-playing games, the tabletop role-playing games, so do you run any? I am, this is actually horribly embarrassing to admit, I have been playing in a Starfinder and Pathfinder, which are sort of, Pathfinder is a Dungeons and Dragons derivative, so it's very simple, it has elves, it has dwarves, it has halflings, which are not hobbits. Starfinder is a newer iteration, which is Pathfinder races, so still elves and dwarves, but taken into space. I am running an online game set in my book setting, which is interesting. The players are trying to blow things up in various new and interesting ways, and I'm finding that actually it's, it's, an, it's a very different challenge 
being a game master because, of course, when you are a writer, we can joke that the characters will not listen to what you are telling them to do, but at the end of the day, you are the writer and you can make them do what you want. This does not work with players, or, I mean, it doesn't work with my players. Maybe it works with your players. Yeah, hi. Hello. You spoke uh, quite a bit about uh, games uh, in literature. But what about literature in games? Do you think it adds to world building to include a lot of literature inside the game, like, for example, in Skyrim? where you have all of these books and uh, tomes uh, uh, of different stories I think the game. Do you think uh, people read them? Do you think it helps them? Or is it pointless? It's not necessarily pointless, but from the game designer side, so I have been researching game design as something that I do on the side, and one of the things they say is that especially these days when people are so crunched for time and so impatient to get to the gameplay, people will scroll down and just click next. So if you write really long, elaborate, unskippable stuff, there is, a, there is definitely a tendency for people to skim and not get the benefit of that extra world building. I think the best of both worlds is where you make it optional or you keep it very short and succinct so that the reader the game player does not become overwhelmed. I'm feeling really lazy standing up here while so, Steve hello. does this. Uh, yeah. I also have a question. Let's uh, take, for example, the same uh, Skyrim mode, the whole Elder Scrolls series. Uh, the lore in the game is like really expansive. It takes, I think, uh, over 10,000 years or something like that. And they're just, you have all the dynasties of emperors and when battle is happening and so on. So what I want to ask you, um, do you think that maybe some uh, well, games or books just simply overdevelop the worlds? And uh, well, maybe they shouldn't do it and uh, just a waste of time. Because as you said, they, previously some people just skim it through. I think, I think in some cases it's a, it's a case of overkill. I know that, I mean, I'm a writer, and I know how much work it takes to write every one of those darn words. And even so, I find myself skipping some of the lore in games, so I definitely sympathize with that. If, I think the fastest way to keep me interested is not talk about, for example, the, so, the queen of so-and-so dynasty 200 years ago that is maybe only tangentially relevant to the game. Um, but the games that I am most likely to read are the ones that are funny. I, th it, I think it was Neverwinter Nights where Naomi Novik did some of the game text, and the game text was funny. Like even the item descriptions was were funny. The the descriptions for the different bad weapons that you could get early in the game those were funny. So I would sit there and collect the weapons and read the read the text and then sell it off for the you know two copper or whatever they gave you. So it's definitely a case of having to find ways to keep the reader's interest. Okay, anyone else wants to ask or guess something? No? Well, in that case, let's thank Yun Ha for the presentation again. And now there's about half an hour, a bit more, until the next talk. Uh, so, well, wander around, enjoy yourselves. The cafe is serving uh, lunch already, so you can uh, have a bite to eat. And there was a sh small technical hiccup with the VR, but it's now been fixed, so uh, you're very welcome to enjoy those experiences too.